oh, look, there's even an official computer voice that tells you. Well, it's 9.30ish, why don't, why don't we make a start? Um, I'm Brian Wetton, I guess because you're here, you've had email from me, so you sort of have seen uh, some of uh, the things I've got posted. Um, I think I mentioned uh, in the sort of introductory uh, video that went around uh, that uh, this is my debut as an online instructor. Uh, I, was, I had an administrative role last term with no teaching. Uh, and so I am inexperienced, but fresh. So we'll see how, uh, how, this, uh, how this goes. Uh, so you can see I'm in my office at, uh, at UBC. Uh, the technical uh, equipment I have here is a bit better than at home. Uh, and my 94 year old father is also at home and, and uh, he would be distracted seeing him walking back and forth behind me. He paces so that he doesn't uh, stiffen up. Um, how I've got it set up is I've got my desktop with the uh, with the uh, the video and the sound, hopefully, and then there's another Brian Wetton who's on this uh, this tablet that my professional development uh, money bought, and I'll be writing out lectures uh, on that. Um, so uh, the lectures are being recorded, uh, and. I will figure out how to um, take the things that I've written on, on this that you'll see uh, coming up uh, uh, and post those. Um, I also have sort of more formal uh, kind of written notes that I write to prepare. Uh, and um, I, I'll post those as well. So you'll have sort of two versions of, of the lecture notes. Uh, some that match your experience and then uh, others that will have more detail and perhaps more correct detail in them. Um, again, since it's my first time doing this, uh, I welcome uh, uh, feedback uh, on, on how things are going at your end. Uh, you, you've survived a term of this already, so you know the limitations. Um, so just... Um, just to remind you, um, I, I actually uh, think that the chat feature in a Zoom or, or other things, platforms like this is actually the only thing that makes it better than um, live lectures. Um, and I'm not going to look at the chat, um, but uh, uh, Maricela, who's the graduate uh, teaching assistant for the class is gonna monitor the chat and she's going to text me uh, if something uh, comes up that I need to respond to. So you can, I'm not, you can do whatever you want. You can talk about the weather. You can talk about how boring I am, how beautiful my hair is, like whatever you want to on chat. Uh, and, um, and then if something uh, needs my attention, <laughs> I will, uh, I will, uh, I will look, uh, look at it. Um, that said, like if 
for some reason, I completely go off the rails. Someone please unmute yourself and let me, uh, let me know. Okay, because, okay. There's no point in me uh, lecturing on for five minutes as I wait for someone to politely say that, you know, my, my audio has gone off or, or whatever. So, um, you know, it's not a small class. It's also not a huge class. Uh, and you, um, your senior students with experience. So, um, you know, use your judgment and interrupt me if you, if you need to. <clears throat> um, Sometimes with hour and a half lectures, uh, professors give a break in the middle. I've never found that the break works. Um, uh, and so what I'm gonna try and do is to remember to end a little bit early. So I'm gonna try and end at 10.45. Um, and I intend to stay on uh, this platform uh, for half an hour afterwards. Now, I know some of you may have other classes you have to go to, uh, but for those that don't, um, that'll be a chance for sort of office hour type discussion uh, after the lecture when it's fresh in your mind. Uh, and I'll also um, post some additional office hours, uh, which will be held on this uh, same platform uh, later this week. Um, okay, if there's no... Um, questions at this point. Um, I'll, uh, I'll start with the material. Um, <clears throat> and it, it's going to seem like sort of one step back. Uh, but there's a couple of techniques uh, that um, are very useful in understanding the behavior of partial differential equations, which model uh, interesting uh, things. Um, and uh, two of them are uh, series solutions or transform solutions. Uh, and the other is uh, Green's functions. I'm gonna have sort of two introductory lectures on those two ideas. Um, uh, and uh, that's today and Thursday. Uh, and I'm going to uh, present them in the simplest context that I can. Uh, which is not a partial differential equation. So we're gonna we're gonna start uh, with a with an easier problem. Okay, easy problem. Here we go. Okay, hopefully you guys are seeing that. Um, oh, um, somewhere in my life, I well, okay, at various times I've gone back and forth between printing and uh, script writing. Uh, and uh, lately, of course, I've discovered that many students can't read script writing. Even domestic students, they're not taught uh, cursive script in, uh, in school anymore. So I'm gonna try and remember to print, but if I forget, someone, uh, someone point, pointed out to me. So <clears throat> I'm gonna have uh, data that's a function of X, uh, and I'm, I'm gonna have a the problem in a in one D in a bounded interval, okay, and the interval is zero to one. I'm calling it X. Um, of course, you can call the uh, independent variable whatever you want, uh, but um, I try and use X for space and T for time to help uh, sort of remind you that the <clears throat> the two um, those two types of variables have different behavior in the, in the solutions. And I'll talk a little bit about that coming up. Okay, there's gonna be data. There's gonna be an unknown. So this is gonna be given. And this is gonna be uh, an unknown function. Uh, often uh, partial differential equations are written with, uh, with a function you're trying to find that's u of x or x and t or x and y. Uh, and uh, it's sort of convenient, U for, for unknown. Uh, now, F for data, uh, that's not so clear where, where, where that comes from, okay? <clears throat> so, of course, you, you can't determine the unknown from the data without some extra information. Uh, and so you're gonna have a, a, a relationship uh, between uh, U and F, uh, and it's going to have two pieces. 
there's going to be a differential equation part, DE for differential equation. Uh, and this applies not just at one point, uh, but at all points X in the interval. Okay, so I'm not imagining that that this is all that this is new for you. I, I just want to make sure we're all on the on the same page. Uh, and I'm going to show you some things that you've seen before, but in a slightly different way, which hopefully uh, will be useful reminding you of other important mathematical concepts uh, and make it easier for us to go forward and do things more generally than you've seen before. Okay. Well, okay. This is a pretty simple relationship, right? And you could imagine you can get u from f by integrating twice. But remember, every time you integrate, uh, you introduce uh, a uh, arbitrary constant. So there's two arbitrary constants. So you know that there has to be two other pieces of information given uh, to be able to solve this problem. And so I'm gonna have a boundary value problem. I'm gonna tell you what the values of u are at the two ends of the, of the interval. So these are boundary conditions. Okay, and then together, this is a boundary value problem, BVP, boundary value problem, okay? So <clears throat> a couple of things, you're all excited about a course on partial differential equations, but you haven't had one yet, right? This is an ordinary differential equation. It's uh, only a, a function of one variable, um, uh, but this is a warm up problem, okay? Uh, and uh, you can think of this uh, as a, a 1D Poisson problem, which is uh, a type of uh, differential equation, which uh, is of elliptic type. We're gonna have three main types of equations as we look in the course. We're gonna have parabolic, elliptic, and hyperbolic equations. So they're the heat equation. What did I say? Uh, elliptic, parabolic, so no. Parabolic is, is the heat equation. Elliptic is Poisson's equation. So this has got the character of that. Uh, and uh, the wave equation has wave-like behavior. Um, uh, that is a hyperbolic equation. So this is a very simple example of an elliptic type problem. Okay, so maybe one of the things I wanna say is that it's not and uh, initial value problem. So we're gonna see later uh, that for this problem, the solution at every point X will depend on F at every point X. So there's a global dependence of the unknown on the data. Now, if we're talking about an initial value problem, then, okay, here I wanna think of u as a function of t. Oh, I got a message. Oh, the, the, uh, the question uh, that came up is what category does Navier-Stokes uh, fall under? Uh, and I have to say it is uh, mixed. If you're talking about the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, what makes it interesting uh, is there is a uh, parabolic, uh, character from the diffusion term. Uh, there is a hyperbolic uh, character from the convection terms. Uh, and if it's incompressible, then there's an elliptic character to the uh, incompressibility constraint. So, so Navier-Stokes uh, rolls all three of these uh, together. Uh, okay, good question. Um, so an initial value problem uh, where I'm gonna just try and signal the difference by calling the independent, uh, the, the independent variable t. If I look at its second derivative is equal to f. Uh, if I'm talking about an initial um, uh, value problem, then I'm gonna give uh, two pieces of data all at the same point, right? So instead of giving uh, a boundary values at either end, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give them all at the same point. 
And here, if I, if I pick some positive time, right, uh, then uh, u of t uh, for times, small times, uh, does not depend on the data at later times, right? So there is a difference in the dependence of the solution uh, on the, um, on the data for initial value problems. Um, so this is kind of interesting, I think already, right? Uh, I make one little change, right? In the conditions that I give to the same looking problem and I get quite different behavior. And this is one of the things that we'll get to in the class is, um, how to recognize looking at a problem, which could come from a model of physics or, or uh, economics or anything. Uh, how do you recognize what type of behavior comes from that model? And of course, you want the model to model some sort of behavior that you're interested in. And so there's some back and forth between um, you know, insight that the model can give you and also a sort of reality check that the model is, uh, is actually describing what you want it to. Okay, so uh, let me go back to, to the boundary value problem, okay? Uh, in my notes, I've given it equation number one. So let's, uh, let's do that. I'm gonna go back to that boundary value problem. Um, so next week, I'm gonna do a little bit of a, a modeling exercise to derive that from a couple of different situations. Um, but let me just say here that this is going to model uh, the vertical displacement uh, of a wire with uh, mass loading uh, f of x. Okay, so I can give you a concrete example. Right, so let's say that F is identically equal to one. So I'm talking about a wire that's stretched uh, and it's got a uniform uh, mass density uh, along, uh, along its length. Uh, what is the, uh, um, the uh, vertical displacement of that, of that wire? Um, and of course there's a sign issue when I talk about vertical displacement uh, with positive mass, then you expect that the displacement will be downwards, right? Um, so uh, downwards is positive in this in this scenario. Uh, so if I've got u double prime is equal to one, uh, then of course I can integrate twice and go that u is x squared over two plus ax plus b. I got the two arbitrary constants that I told you would, would come from this thing. And these you can match uh, with the boundary conditions. So if I've got u of zero is zero, that gives me, uh, oh, oh, I've changed my a and b from my notes. That gives me b is zero. And then if I've got u at one is equal to zero, that tells me that a is, minus one half. So that tells me my solution is one half <coughs> x squared minus x. And just to highlight the symmetry, I can complete the square and say that this is one half x minus one half squared minus a quarter. And <coughs> so the solution is gonna look like, uh, oh, Oh, it's gonna look like this. With maximum uh, displacement minus one eighth. Now, of course you look at this and uh, I know a number of people in the audience uh, have some physics background and you go, uh, there's no units here, right? This is a whole dimensionless thing. 
So we'll talk about that uh, on Tuesday as well. Uh, some of the students with physics background will know about uh, scaling and non-dimensionalization. Um, and for the rest of you, you'll get a taste of that uh, uh, in a lecture next week. Okay, so here you go, right? That This is the sort of thing where you can get solutions. Uh, now I'm gonna go through um, three important ideas uh, connected with this type of problem. Uh, I'm gonna remind you of uh, uh, the properties of linearity. Um, we're gonna talk about well-posedness <clears throat> and we're gonna talk about weak solutions, okay? So here we go, let's talk about linearity. So uh, it's a linear problem. Um, and you guys <clears throat> have, are familiar with uh, linear, people talk about linear. <clears throat> but let me remind you what this really does for you. Uh, and it, it's that you have the superposition property. Okay, so <clears throat> that is if I've got two solutions. So if I've got <clears throat> one solution and it solves the boundary value problem. Remember, I can't talk about the boundary value problem without including the boundary conditions. Okay, and I've got a second solution. to the same boundary value problem, uh, then of course I can make a linear combination of those solutions that solves the same boundary value problem with the same linear combination of right-hand side data. So W, so C1, uh, U1 plus C2, U2, that's a linear combination of those solutions. These are just constants. Then this is gonna solve W with the same boundary conditions. So this is really the, the sort of key thing with, uh, with linearity. Uh, if you find a solution, you don't just find one, you find a whole family of solutions, right? If you find two solutions, you have a two parameter family of, of solutions. So you can really build up understanding of uh, how the problem behaves uh, with, uh, with linear problems, just by you know, finding a couple of solutions, suddenly you, you can see a whole bunch of things going on. And that's just not true for nonlinear problems, right? <clears throat> okay, and uh, in this context, uh, where um, as we go on to other problems, we're gonna have not just one type of data, we're gonna have uh, interior data like F and boundary data. Uh, and for second order problems in time, we'll have initial data for the solution and initial data for its time derivative. Um, if you have a linear problem, you can divide uh, all that, uh, that up. And I'm just gonna give you an example here. So I'm going back to uh, the boundary uh, value problem one, but now I'm gonna give uh, non-zero uh, boundary uh, data. So these are just, these are also data, they're given numbers. So in the example that I had of the uh, vertical displacement under uh, weight, these are the fact that the string is not uh, un unloaded, is not um, 
uh, horizontal, there's like uh, displacements that are given A and B at the, at the two ends. Okay, and because of linearity, not only is the equation uh, linear, but the boundary conditions are linear. Um, I can write this problem out as a sum of three problems, each of which has only one type of data in it. So uh, U is the sum of three solutions. So I, I have U Roman numeral one, U Roman numeral two and U Roman numeral three. Uh, and what does this one solve? This one solves the boundary value problem that we started with, with homogeneous boundary conditions. Oh. Oh, I have the question uh, from, from a student. Uh, does any constant include complex numbers? Um, okay, so uh, when we go to this problem, uh, and there are there are times uh, when uh, when it makes sense to look at this type. Oh, I can point as much as I want at that, but you can't see me pointing. If I looked at this problem. Um, there are times when it is, uh, it's useful um, to think of uh, the solution U as complex with a complex F and complex A and B. Um, but since the coefficients in the problem are real, all that's going to mean is you're going to have a separation of the problem uh, into its real and its imaginary parts. Like you can solve for the real part of this whole thing and then solve for the complex part of this whole thing and then just put them together. So yes, you can think of this as a complex problem, but it really just boils down to two uh, linear problems or two, uh, two real problems. Again, and that's from the from the linearity. Uh, if you have, okay, once you get into the realm of uh, nonlinear complex problems, uh, okay, you're outside of Math 400. I'll just say that. Okay, let me go back to back to this. I, I could add another thing uh, here to this list if I had complex F, A, and B. That in fact I'd have four problems that I would look at. Uh, one of them would be uh, something that looks like this, uh, but only for the real part. Uh, and then um, uh, another part that looked at only the complex part. Okay, so what are the other things? Uh, this, this one obviously doesn't solve my problem because it, it's got the wrong boundary conditions. So um, the other pieces, are going to have homogeneous data uh, for everything but one of the boundary conditions. And then the third one will have homogeneous conditions for everything except the last boundary condition that, uh, that we took, right? Okay. And if you think about it, of course, if the second derivative is zero, then it's just a linear function, you know, uh, something a constant plus another constant times x, and so this is easy to solve. Oh, it even erases, and this one is b times x. And so if you were wondering uh, why uh, I started off my discussion with homogeneous boundary conditions and didn't think of boundary conditions, it's because it's easy to put them in post-processing them. And again, look at this structure, right? This structure is you're dividing the problem into problems in which only one of the data show up 
and the others are homogeneous. And of course, you can see pretty clearly if you add those up, you get u double prime is f, u at zero is a, and u at one is b. So it's exactly the solution that you're looking for. Uh, and this is going to be nice uh, as things go on, as we get more complicated problems with different types of data, we can just divide them up and look at each of the data uh, individually. Okay, linearity. That was, uh, that's a useful idea uh, and there's a reminder of it. Uh, what about well-posedness? So this is a general idea we're gonna have for um, um, partial differential equations that we study. Uh, let me just quote you some theory. Uh, <clears throat> if I've got f is a continuous function, then there is a unique solution u of x with two continuous derivatives. Now, this is called a strong solution. Remember, one of the things I'm gonna tell you about is weak solutions. So there you go. This is a strong solution. Um, and what it really means is, right? I am gonna have a real function u in which I can take its two derivatives and have it equal to f at every x, right? That's the sort of solution you're expecting. And of course, uh, maybe it'll be more of a surprise when I tell you uh, that uh, you can also talk about weak solutions, which satisfy the equation in some sense, but not in that point-wise strong sense that this one uh, does. Okay, to talk about well-posedness, which is another theoretical result, uh, I have to tell you about some function spaces. Okay, and this is something, of course, some of you have seen before. Um, I'm gonna talk about the space of continuous functions. So it's, it's gonna be a linear space, right? If you uh, take linear combinations of continuous functions, they're also continuous. So here we go. I'm gonna talk about the space of continuous functions. Uh, on the interval, right? I've got my problem is in this bounded interval and that's, that's the thing I'm looking at. I'm also gonna look at C2. This is the space of functions with continuous second derivatives. Um, if you've taken some analysis classes, you know that if you've got a continuous function on a bounded interval, it's bounded. And so I can talk about a norm. This is just a measure of size uh, for continuous functions, just as the maximum value on the interval. Uh, and I can also talk about uh, the size of the function in the space C2. It's the maximum value of u plus the maximum value of the first derivative plus the maximum value of the second derivative. Okay, function spaces. Maybe you've never seen a function space before, but now you can't go home and tell anyone else that, that that's true anymore, right? Okay, you've seen one. Okay, so let me say uh, more theory. Shows that there is a positive constant so that 
Uh, if I look at uh, U, this is the solution of the boundary value problem. Measured, I know that if uh, F is continuous, then U has two continuous second derivatives. So I, I can get a size of the, of the solution in this norm. It's bounded by the size of the data that you get. Okay, and this is true uh, for every F, right? So there's a K independent of F so that this is true. For every data that you give, uh, there is this bound. Now I'm gonna use linearity again, okay? So let's consider uh, two solutions. With uh, with the, the same boundary conditions that we uh, that we've always had. That's supposed to be a two. So I've got two solutions. So you know that uh, W uh, that this solves. Uh, the BVP uh, one with data F one minus F two, right? That's the same, the same uh, thing that we had before. So that means I can use this result on W. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, that says W. That's U one minus U two, measured in this pretty strict norm, right? Uh, is smaller than a constant times F1 minus F2. Uh, I got a question, does K depend on the uh, left-hand side? No, okay? So this is, you give me an F, right? I find the solution uh, U, right? And I can guarantee that what comes out is smaller than what came in in this way, whatever F you give me, right? And U is a unique solution. So I don't have to worry about like which U I'm talking about here. There's just that one solution. Okay, and what does this say? Okay, this says, well, first of all, this, uh, this shows uniqueness. Right, because if I've got the same F, uh, then this is zero, and then uh, the same U has to come out. Okay, so so that shows uniqueness. Now, why am I showing this when I already said it was unique? Because this shows more than that. This shows that if uh, you have small changes in the data. Uh, then you have small changes in the solution. And this concept is called well posedness. Right. Of course, the opposite is a problem that's ill posed. That's a problem where you can make arbitrarily small changes in the input and get arbitrarily large changes in the output. And of course, that doesn't seem like a reasonable problem, right? How can you have any reliability on uh, what you're doing if you can make infinitesimal changes and have huge uh, in the data and have huge changes in the solution, right? That, that's not a good problem to, to look at. So uh, we're uh, going to concentrate, obviously, on, on, um, on well-posed problems. And that's some of the use of the theory uh, is, uh, is to get at these kind of ideas. OK, the third thing in this, um, uh, in this preliminary thing uh, was weak solutions. Okay, and um, 
maybe uh, I can only see a few faces, but uh, but um, maybe like me, they're sort of glazing glazing over. I I think I have a poll. Let's do a poll just to just to spice things up. Okay, here we go. Oh, I'm a co-host. I can't vote. I I have a physics background. I, I can I can tell you my my thing. Okay, so now we can uh, see all kinds of things from this. I'm gonna end the poll uh, in five seconds. And I can share the results. Um, Matthew Sahota, raise your hand if you can see the results, because I can see you. Okay, good, good, thank you. Um, so uh, why do I have to be picked on? Just because I, you're a face I could see. I'm sorry. I, I'll, I'll pick on someone else next time. Um, Thanks. So uh, yeah, as I suspected, there's a bunch of uh, physics and engineering physics students in the, in the audience. Um, I'm a little bit surprised actually at the number of uh, economics uh, background uh, people uh, out there. Um, I don't have a whole lot of things for the uh, the uh, economics thing, but there's all kinds of interesting partial differential equations in that field. Uh, one of the things that I was going to do is uh, is at the end of the course, as a sort of advanced topic, we can talk about free boundary value problems, and there's an interesting one in uh, finance called the Black-Scholes um, equation that has a free boundary, which is when you should sell something. Okay, I'm not an economics person, uh, but I'll, I'll try and find a few others to put in the, in the, in the class as things go, go on. Okay, so um, I'll stop. Uh, and, oh, whoop. Uh, and uh, go back to, to this. This is a little bit of motivation uh, for me to say, um, certainly from physics, uh, and uh, if I knew more about economics uh, problems, it would probably also be true. Um, uh, uh, there's often uh, cases uh, where uh, you idealize data Uh, to be discontinuous. Uh, in physics, some of you, I, I don't know where you are in your studies. Um, you also have the idea that you can have data that's more than discontinuous. Uh, you can have like impulse functions uh, and uh, their um, distributions, which we'll sort of, I'll hazily talk about maybe in Math 400, but if you're interested in that, uh, Math 401 is something where you can uh, uh, look at the theory of that kind of thing uh, more in depth. Uh, so for instance, we could consider uh, F of X. Uh, and if you're thinking of our, our string with the mass on it, you can sort of think of an idealized case where you have a uniform uh, mass on the right-hand side, uh, but no mass on the left-hand side, right? And now F is not continuous. So the corresponding uh, U of X solution cannot be, uh, it have two continuous derivatives, which means you have to wonder uh, what does 
u double prime equals f mean in this case. Okay, and I'll say uh, the corresponding uh, solution does exist in this case. Uh, it is unique. Uh, and uh, if you talk about the right kind of function spaces, it, it will be a well-posed problem. And we're gonna see uh, one way, um, and I, I was gonna say in this lecture, but actually we may not get to it in this lecture. Um, timing is uh, always difficult to judge at the beginning of a course, and especially in this format that's new to me. Um, but we will see uh, soon, we'll see a way where you can make sense of the weak solution. Um, but let me just say um, uh, one way uh, to make sense of it uh, is as a limit. Okay, so here is the data, right? I go to one half and then it's one, there's F. Okay, and now I can I can do a different color because I got that. Uh, let's do green, okay. So now I can define a family of functions where I just smooth out this discontinuity a little bit. So it'll be zero, it'll be one, and then I'm gonna smooth it out. So this is gonna be smooth. Uh, F epsilon of X, where I've smoothed it out over a distance epsilon, right? And so, well, this is a function that's continuous. So this is gonna give a solution U epsilon of X. And uh, now you have to do some uh, theoretical work to show that this converges to a function u of x that we would call the weak solution. Okay, and we're gonna see uh, quite a different way to, uh, to come up with a weak solution, uh, which again, with some sort of heavy the theory lifting uh, can be shown to be equivalent to this, uh, this way of getting at a, at a weak solution, okay? Okay. Um, we can say um, that part one of a long number of parts of Math 400, uh, section 201 uh, is, is finished. So you've seen a boundary value problem, which is, uh, it's an ordinary differential equation, but it's, it's got some of the characters of uh, elliptic problems that we'll see later on, SPDEs. Uh, and we've seen the ideas of uh, linearity, well-posedness, and weak solutions. I'd just like to add one thing. I think the reason why they call it a weak solution is because of the implication of weak conversions, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Um, another uh, thing is um, there is okay. Um, uh, the um, the, the, the theoretical goal, yeah, would be to, to show that if you uh, look at this limit, right, of these functions in this solution, um, uh, that, uh, that you get this kind of convergence. Now, weak solution, it would be weak convergence in the sense that uh, it, it would not be convergence in this norm, it would be convergence in a norm that only had first derivatives in it. Okay, so that, that's the other thing, right? If you talk about strong and weak, it's about uh, how, um, how strong the control you have over the size of the solution is. Okay, so for instance, you can show this type of convergence in, in a C1 norm. 
okay if 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 you're if you're if you're interested okay so now i'm going to go on to part two now this uh to a certain extent is going to look like an aside and this is the first time i've done this uh, type of presentation uh, but if you're looking at series solutions um which seem like they're they're sort of i don't know um something completely new um they they really aren't right they are um natural extensions of uh, eigen analysis uh for matrices uh and so uh, i'm going to uh i am going to Um, I'm going to take you through some eigen analysis of matrices, specifically um, uh, eigen analysis for symmetric matrices, uh, which uh, with the background most of the students have, you will have seen this, um, but um, uh, just, just in case, and, 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 and again, just so that we're on the same uh, page. Uh, another thing I want to talk about is symmetrization, um, and that is a topic that we'll probably end up uh, leaving until um, next lecture or maybe later on when we need it. Okay, so uh, let's let's talk about eigen uh, values and eigen vectors. So I'm going to have an n by n matrix. Okay, and this this extra line is what I, I use to to remind people that it's a it's a matrix. And so this is going to be an n component uh, column vector. So I'm not in the realm of uh, differential equations anymore. I'm just in the realm of linear algebra. Uh, if I've got this kind of relationship where this lambda uh, is a scalar. That means just a number. Right? Uh, for a non zero vector. Oh, and you can now see my um, notation for vectors. Okay, I've got the, the underbar. You can put the arrow kind of thing over the top, but uh, I'm, I'm mathematicians are, are lazy and uh, underbar is the easiest thing. Uh, okay, so if you've got this arrangement where you have a particular direction uh, that um, is unchanged when you multiply by A, right? So it's scaled. Right, so the direction gets multiplied by something, but the direction doesn't change. Uh, whoop, whoop. Uh, then uh, lambda is uh, an eigenvector of the matrix A, and uh, U is the corresponding. Uh, eigen value. Oh, u not equal to zero. Okay. Um, so, and remember, as you look at this, um, if this is true, uh, then uh, then you can talk about the eigenvector or any non-zero multiple of it. So uh, eigenvectors have uh, arbitrary non-zero magnitude. If you've used uh, MATLAB to find eigenvectors of a, of a matrix, um then um uh, they come out uh with uh length one right 
So that's how you can make them uh, less arbitrary. Uh, oh, okay. Um, I wish I could say I'd never done this before. <laughs> Eigen value, Eigen vector. Okay, so uh, uh, Maricela, you don't have to text me on, on that one. Okay, I saw that one uh, come up. Um, that is a, a typical Brian Wetton mistake, by the way. Um, Okay, so let's let's talk about uh, talk about some of these things. So let's talk about symmetric matrices. So I'm going to talk about symmetric matrices with real coefficients. Uh, some uh, people from physics may uh, know the idea of Hermitian um, uh, uh, Hermitian matrices. That's not what I'm talking about. These are these are like uh, simpler than that, right? So that means uh, A, uh, the matrix A is equal to its transpose. Um, now, if you know Einstein's summation convention, okay, there, there's a, probably a better way to write out what I'm gonna, gonna show. Um, but, um, Really, I, I want to uh, show you how you can have this property um, and have it in a more uh, general um, uh, uh, more general context. Uh, because in fact, as I look at my boundary value problem, one, it's, um, it's going to be a symmetric problem. Um, and yet I can't talk about like the transpose of the second derivative. So I have to think of it in a different way. Uh, okay, so here we go. Um, without Einstein's summation convention, I'm gonna consider uh, V, uh, this is the dot product uh, with uh, A times U. Right, okay. Now remember, a column vector comes out of this multiplication. And then when I take the dot product, this is just a number. Right, dot product of two vectors, a number comes out. Right, another way I can write this, right? I, I don't know if you remember this, but if you've got like two column vectors here and the dot product is just you multiply across and then you add them up, right? Uh, another way to write that is you could take V transpose, right? And just do matrix multiplication because matrix multiplication is you turn it sideways and then multiply across and add them up. So this is exactly the same thing as V transpose times A times the vector U, right? Uh, and because this is just a number, then it's equal to its transpose. And so remember if you take the transpose of matrix multiplication, it's the matrix multiplication of the transposes, but in the reverse order, right? So this is V transpose A U transpose. That's U transpose A V. Remember, because A is symmetric, it's equal to its transpose, right? And this is just the dot product of U with uh, A times V. So I've got V dot product with A times U is the same thing as U dot product with A times V. 
So now I'm going to write that. Uh, oh, what am I going to do? No, I'm not going to write that in uh, in our product notation. I'm going to I'm going to go on. So let's write that out. So B dot A U is equal to U dot A V for all U and V if A is symmetric. Uh, let me just say that this is an if and only if statement. Let's consider uh, u and v uh, as the basis vectors. If u is the ith component uh, basis vector uh, unit, and v is the jth component uh, unit basis vector, uh, then this gives you the ij component of a, and this gives you the ji component of a. And so it's just saying that aij is the same thing as aji, right? That's true for every i and j. That makes, if this is true, then a has to be symmetric, okay? So now I'm gonna write this out uh, in inner product notation. Because the dot product you also can't talk about uh, in terms of uh, continuous functions, but we will be able to talk about the inner product. Same thing as the dot product uh, in, in um, um, in um, for vectors. So this is true uh, if uh, A is symmetric. And so what it means is, okay, if you've got a symmetric matrix, then you can write out this kind of inner product and you can just fish A from one side and move it to the other side. If A is not symmetric, you can't do that, right? Right, uh, but if A is symmetric, you can you can do that. Now in this context, if I had an inner product for continuous functions, I could talk about my second derivative operator with boundary conditions, right? And I could see if I can move it from one side of the other in, in this way. And that's what I'm gonna do, probably not this lecture, but next lecture. Okay, so symmetric matrices, ah, ah. Uh, have some nice properties. Uh, for uh, eigen analysis. So uh, eigen values uh, are uh, always real. Right? Uh, eigen vectors. from different eigenvalues uh, are orthogonal. Well, and of course we're gonna have uh, the same uh, story for our boundary value problem. Um, uh, and we're going to have real eigenvalues uh, and real eigenfunctions, which will be the sign series, right? If you uh, remember that from, from previous courses. Uh, and it's the same uh, kind of reasoning that, that leads you uh, to that. The other thing I can say is, I don't know if you remember eigen analysis from math courses in, in, in the past, uh, but there can be something called deficient matrices. 
where you have fewer eigenvectors than the dimension of the space. Um, that doesn't happen for symmetric matrices. So there uh, is an orthonormal. So that is uh, an orthonormal basis is, is a set of vectors that span the space, they're orthogonal, and they have length one. And uh, this is of eigenvectors. <coughs> so if A has no repeated eigenvalues, then this would be true automatically. But even if there's repeated eigenvalues for a symmetric matrix, you can always, if they're repeated twice, there's a two-dimensional set of eigenvectors associated with that eigenvalue. Okay, so what am I going to do? Um, <clears throat> let me prove two. Uh, and I'll do the same thing uh, for the boundary value problem case when we, when we get there. So I'm going to look at two eigenvectors of this symmetric matrix. Ah. Uh, and they're going to be different. And I want to show that V1 and V2 have to be orthogonal. Okay, so what you do, remember symmetric matrices, you can fish the A multiplication in an inner product from one side and put it onto the other. So I want to look at uh, this um, property. Uh, this is uh, due to the uh, symmetry of the matrix A. That's not true for every matrix A, right? But it is true uh, here. Now I'm gonna use that this is an eigen vector with eigenvalue one. This is an eigen vector with eigenvalue two. So I can combine these things and get lambda two minus lambda one times the same inner product has to be zero. These are different, so that's not zero. So uh, V1 and V2 must be orthogonal. Okay, um, proving that they're real is easy if you uh, do some bookkeeping but I didn't think of a good way to do the bookkeeping. So I'm gonna leave that one. I can tell you the idea of the proof. Uh, that's consider a subspace. That's the span of some eigenvectors that you found. You know that there's at least one eigenvector, right? So, uh, this is going to be, you're going to keep doing this until you find them all. So you haven't found them all yet, right? Uh, then it can be shown. Uh, there is an eigen vector of the matrix A uh, in the space that's perpendicular to the ones you've already found. Ah, I'm getting a LinkedIn message right where I want to write. Okay, perpendicular space uh, of vectors. Perpendicular. Uh, space of vectors. <laughs> perpendicular to the ones you've already found. OK. 
Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> I got six minutes left, unless my watch has gone wonky. Um, and so um, I was gonna skip this part and zoom into the rest, but um, uh, instead I'll finish out with this thing and we'll pick up how these ideas look uh, for uh, boundary value problems, which are also gonna be symmetric uh, or uh, symmetrizable um, and have uh, eigenvalue solutions and so on. Oh, in fact, maybe I won't do that. Maybe I will um, remind you what uh, finding the eigen uh, vectors is gonna do for us. Okay, so let's let's go. Now I've got uh, the symmetric uh, matrix, uh, and I'm going to consider solving uh, a times u is equal to f. And remember, this is a proxy of um, our problem, uh, our boundary value problem. But now it's just a, a linear algebra problem. So I'm going to assume that the matrix is invertible. So uh, no uh, lambda equals zero eigenvalues. Okay, so with the eigenvectors, I can build up the solution. So if I have a right-hand side that's an eigenvector, then the solution uh, is one over that eigenvalue times the eigenvector. Okay, how do I know that? Well, if I take A times U, well, when I take A times VJ, I get lambda J times VJ, right? The lambdas cancel out and I get the right-hand side. And of course, it's a linear problem, right? So I can take a linear combination of eigenvectors. Remember, this is a basis, right? So I can get any function f that I want, right? Uh, then the solution that will come out is the same uh, linear combination with the lambda factors in it. Right, so that's pretty, that's pretty good, right? Uh, any solution you write like this, I can tell you what the solution is right away. But of course, if you don't give me this linear combination, but just tell me an F, uh, then I can always write out what it is as a linear combination. Uh, pretty easily, right? Because this is an orthonormal basis. So to get the coefficients in the linear combination, I just take the inner product of F with VJ. Okay, how do I know that works, right? Right, because if I take the inner product of F with VJ over here, right, then I would have to take the inner product of F with VJ over here. Let me say VI, 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 right? So then if I is not equal to J, then the vectors are orthogonal. So I don't see a whole sum. I just see one thing that comes out. That's AI times the inner product of VI with VI. But those vectors have length one. So that's just one that gives me this result, right? And so the solution is it's going to be a sum over the eigenvectors. Uh, and what is the sum? It's the inner product of F with VJ over lambda J, right? This is looks complicated, but this is just a, a, a number. It's just a scalar times um, 
times a um, times the vector. Now, if you've got any reminiscence of the sine series in your head, then you know we're going to be able to write the solution of our boundary value problem. A u is a function of x is a function, a sum of uh, some signs with some coefficients. And the coefficients come uh, by integrating the right-hand side function f with the same sine function, right? And so this is going to uh, look very familiar when we get to that, when we get to that stage. Um, Okay, by my watch, I have one minute. Let me just do a quick example, just to make sure this should all be old news, but uh, let's just say maybe it isn't. Let's see how this works. I'm going to have a, uh, a two by two symmetric matrix. Right, I'm gonna find its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. This is something that's not too hard to do. Gonna normalize them. Okay, you can just check and see that those are the eigenvectors. Uh, and then if I'm going to do this game where I'm going to uh, solve uh, a times u is equal to the vector one zero, so it's not an eigenvector. Uh, so I have to figure out what here's my vector f. I have to figure out what the inner product is. with one of the eigenvectors and then the other eigenvector, right? I'm just getting off, uh, taking the inner product means I'm just taking off this coefficient here. Uh, and then my theory tells me I can write this now as a sum of this coefficient and then divide by the eigenvector and then multiply by the eigenvector, which is scaled. And then I have to add the other eigenvector. So I get this coefficient. I divide by the eigenvalue and then I multiply by the eigenvector, which is scaled. And this gives me minus one half minus one half plus minus one sixth one sixth that gives me minus two thirds minus one third and you can check this solves the, the system Okay, um, let's, uh, let's end here, 1047. Okay, so I stole two minutes from what I told you I, I, would, I would do. Um, the, um, this lecture will be uploaded at some point whenever it you know, converts and, and uploads. I'm gonna put it on YouTube and I'll add the link to the Canvas course page. Uh, I'll put these notes on the Canvas course page. Uh, and like I say, I also have some more uh, formal uh, notes, um, which I will also put up uh, with some extra detail and maybe with fewer mistakes. Well, we'll see, we'll see how that, how that goes. Um, and again, uh, this is uh, my debut uh, with online lecturing. And so uh, please do uh, stay on after class if, if you can and, and, and uh, describe them in person or send me an email with, uh, with things I could do to, to improve. And otherwise, I will see you on Thursday.
Okay, I'm going to stop recording.